When I was 12, 13, and I was calling bulletin board systems, I had this real impulse to save all of the text files that I saw online. And it wasn't that hard to do. I mean, I would just copy and paste text or, or use the buffer in my terminal program and save it to a disk. And since these floppy disks could hold hundreds of K, it wasn't that hard to save the text files from dozens and then later hundreds of bulletin boards. When I finally created textfiles.com in, in 1998, 20 years ago, I uh, was basically down to a few dozen floppy disks, and that was the core of what I had done with text files. So it was a success all around. In 2004, I got another urge, and that was to save all of the podcasts. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Dan Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. You look back at some kind of blue sky project that you get involved with, and at the time, there are limits to what can be done or what people think can be done. And a lot of those center around cost, capacity, hardware, time. And at the moment that the project is being worked on, you will get pushback from others or yourself telling you that's impossible. There's not enough space. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough money. And if you're of a certain stock, those complaints don't matter. So when I started thinking about the fact, the indisputable fact, that podcasts were important, I thought about saving them. And what would that entail? At the time, a podcast could be anywhere between uh, maybe 10 or, or 20 megabytes per episode per podcast. And even at that time, there were now dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of podcasts that were rising up. The history of podcasts is actually rather complicated. And like bulletin boards and like a lot of other technologies, it's got a lot of fathers, and it has an even larger amount of predecessors. You can play games with where the first hacker conference is. I always say that it's the, the world's fair in the 19th century, but in the case of podcasts, you can definitely find out about these cassettes for the blind and for others that came regularly in the mail. I've been making an effort on the archive to save some of these. They would come once a month and they would give you the news relevant to the audience. And they would also have features or interviews or just read from some sort of paper about what was going on that month. And, and again, it would just be mailed to people's houses like a magazine subscription, except that you popped it in your cassette player and you let it run. It was a amazing piece of work, just like a podcast. It was unquestionably a regularly released piece of media that would tell you things with the intention of being distributed to a wide as possible audience and played again and again as needed without any consideration for being instantly broadcast. There's a big debate about how podcasts were RSS feeds plus media and created ostensibly by Dave Weiner, but there are many things before it. It was just a case that it was a little more convenient and there were client programs that kind of understood what was going on, but there are talk shows like IT Conversations on the Internet all throughout the 1990s. You can find all sorts of these artifacts on the Internet Archive. And the fact that there was a fun name around a technology, iPod Broadcast, doesn't make it the opener. But it reached a larger and more obvious audience once it became a concept 
a term, and maybe we'll even call it a fad. And around that time, a part of me started to get my old archiver sense, that sense that something was happening, something was going on, and there was a danger that people weren't recognizing, that it needed some sort of permanent or permanent as possible storage to ensure its future. Podcasts, I decided, in 2004 were that very thing. Here was a self-directed project to understand a whole wide range of subjects and broadcast them to an audience by people who had no experience, little experience, or lots of experience doing so. It was something for everyone. The, the tools to get them were pretty simple, and the subject matter wasn't limited. What would people do? It, it kind of became a free-for-all. People would talk about wine, about politics, about bicycles, about adventures, about what kind of technology they wanted to see, what kind of technology they were using. It was a slice of life, and I just was worried, and my archivist sense tingled, that people might not think to put them away somewhere. I mean, after all, 10 megabytes an episode was murderous at the time. I was very lucky. I had Fios in the house. I had servers in the basement. I, I paid extra money to have multiple IPs assigned to me. I could, in other words, do what it took to save podcasts. The project became known as Podsucker. It was a machine that I custom built. Uh, it ran FreeBSD and it had multiple uh, serial ATA connectors and could connect four 500 gigabyte SATA drives to them, which at the time seemed like an interminable amount of space. And, and the idea here would be that I would be saving all of these podcasts into directories that would then be burnt to DVDRs, please forgive me, and then labeled in such a way that I could find the podcasts again. I focused on the XML file and the RSS feed and, and used them, the, these normalized files that would come in with every podcast, to document in their own way what the podcasts were and, and, and maybe allow somebody later to deal with them. Like a lot of things I was doing at the time, I, I announced it on my blog and it got some attention. Uh, I began the downloading and I was using multiple podcast directories to find out what was out there. And of course, I was downloading everything that was accessible uh, up to that point. Uh, some of these podcasts, they would only keep uh, a few episodes up and, and, and get rid of the rest, believe it or not. But other ones would keep it all the way to the beginning. And I made sure to download whatever was originally there and what was new and then keep checking to see if anything had changed. And in a short time, I discovered that I had dozens of gigabytes of MP3 files from all over the world. Uh, I was saving them, putting them in directories, and then writing script after script after script to quality check my own work, to deal with weird XML files, to understand what the descriptions were doing, to basically make sure that I wasn't screwing this up too hard. My methods were, as often they are, made up as I go along. I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I, I just thought this was a good project. I, I wrote the scripts to do it. I, I found ways to discover where podcasts were, and I just started doing it. And, and within a month or so, I discovered that I was going to have a bit of a disk problem. And, and that's when I started to price out buying larger and larger disks uh, to come up with ways to shut the machine down cleanly so that I could install the next few disks and, and, and most importantly, uh, come up with a way to indicate what files I had already downloaded because they would be moved to other drives and there wouldn't be any other evidence of them. Uh, these are problems that computer science people deal with all the time, but this is not my area. I'm not a coder. I'm just a guy who writes scripts a little bit too much all the time to do the thing that he wants and doesn't know when to stop. Podsucker 
blazed through the night. It was constantly downloading podcasts. I would go down there and I'd see it blinking. I'd look at my status screen and there would be just so many files going by. It would be scrolling at an enormous speed as it went from episode to episode to episode. And I started to get a little worried that maybe I'd bitten off more than I could chew. And, and I was interviewed at this time by a guy named Christopher Lydon, who in the Boston area is a legendary broadcaster, and he had created a show called Radio Open Source that was meant to be a new dawn of talk show at the time. And what's funny is that I had recently tried to find a copy of the episode of Radio Open Source, and it's not on their website anymore. I had to go to the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine was downloading podcasts all the time. I did have competition there, although I didn't know it. Uh, but nobody was downloading podcasts at the rate that I was. I, I, I guess it was a sickness. It felt like it was something that needed to be done long after Logic had said I should stop. From 2004 to 2006, Podsucker ran day and night and filled up tons and tons of disk space with podcasts that have long since gone into the ether. Podcasting uh, faded a little bit, but then came roaring back. When people describe when podcasts began, a surprising number of people think they began in 2011, uh, somehow obliterating the history before, but we see this happen all the time. Uh, podcasts are as big as they've ever been bigger even. They've become even better produced. There are companies that do nothing but produce these new podcasts. There are small radio shows. There are large radio shows. There are people who take media and dump it into a podcast format such that you, you can't help but, but want it. And, and these days, uh, my pod sucker is dwarfed by the power of the Internet Archive. It turned out that hitching my tiny wagon to the Internet's blazing star was a very good idea. Uh, the Archive is a depository for all sorts of podcasts that others are recording. They, they go out of their way to upload them. We don't need to have a crawler running for half of the podcasts that we get because people use the Internet Archive as their storage space. At the last time I checked, the Internet Archive had over 171,000 episodes of different podcasts up. Uh, everything from church sermons to straight-up television shows that had been ported to radio shows that had been ported to podcast forms. Uh, we are mirroring thousands of hours of radio every day. We are obviously grabbing television. We are obviously grabbing web. And through all of this, this mega sucker that has replaced that fun machine in my basement, I think the urge and the concern is the same. This is history. This is human history. Truth is being spoken on these podcasts. Lies are being spoken, but they are human, human expressions, seen nowhere else in some cases. These are the human spirit in audio form. I can't think of a more noble endeavor than overseeing in some way their persistence and not letting things like lapsed hosting or forgotten bills uh, stopping us in the future from learning what was important to us today. As for why I stopped, you know, I don't remember. I guess I just got to a point around 2006 that I said, I think I have a pretty good sample. You know, I, I'd taken this core sample of the podcast world, the heart of all of this self-created media, and I felt like this was going to be enough for us to understand later. You know, a lot of those early podcasts around the era of 2004, there's no evidence of them anymore. Their files went away, their hosts went away. Evidence that they ever existed has faded into darkness, and being able to bring it back all of a sudden, and that was a real joy. Against all logic and reason, the DVD-Rs that I saved many of these podcasts on were fine. 
That's not usually the story with DVD-Rs. They are organic ink sprayed onto plastic, and the organic part dies. And the fact is, is we are losing DVD-Rs as soon as a few months after they're written. But we were lucky. All of mine worked, and I put them on the Internet Archive as the 2005 podcast core sample. I was pretty proud of it, and I let people know about it, but I felt like it wasn't everything, like the stack of DVD-Rs I had found wasn't enough. And, and that changed uh, this past week. Uh, my buddy Kyle and I went through the storage unit that I still have of what remains from the shipping container I used to have, and I have found piles of disk drives waiting for me to reevaluate them. And one of them that I found turned out to have labeled most interestingly podcasts three had all sorts of recordings that I had forgotten that I had saved. And I immediately started pulling them off this drive. And, and it turned out that I had 1,700 different shows and thousands and thousands of episodes just on this drive alone. So turns out I may have even more than I expected. I like to think that others were doing this. I, I haven't seen anyone come forward, but it can't be me alone. There have to have been others in so many places, in so many different endeavors, who have this urge. This urge that says, if I don't move on this, who will? How long will this stick around? How long will it be before this thing that I'm seeing, this piece of history, this piece of reality, fades away into darkness? This is a philosophy that has paid off for me time and time again. There have been things that I tucked away that I kind of forgot about even, but then times would pass and I would go back to these little stores that I kept uh, underneath some boxes or, or in a cabinet. And and I would be so happy about what I had thought at that time. I'd be rewarded in so many ways. And I like to think that the world has too. Maybe if you were waiting for the signal, the call, to tell you that that thing you've been looking at, that you think is really special, well, I guess this is that signal. This is Jason Scott. You've been listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Sam Johnston, Adam Green, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There's a relationship to money that I have that uh, has always been something uh, that I've always had to work through, which is uh, when I was younger, uh, after my parents divorced, uh, the money was very strict. My mother didn't work, and most of the quote-unquote income came from alimony, money that my father paid my mother for, for child support. And I didn't have a job when I was younger, and when I moved in with my father, I wasn't allowed to get a job. My father thought it would distract from my studies and, and make me not as good a student, which is probably true, and I am very lucky that we had the luxury at the time to not require me to work. But I feel like I did miss out in getting a real sense of economics and what money meant and how to build a budget and how to understand uh, the money that comes in versus the money that, that goes out. Uh, for a long time, I just winged it. I just kind of did what made sense. I bought things until I couldn't buy things. And, and later when I had credit cards, I bought things until I could keep buying things, even though I technically couldn't buy things. Something that I'm always working through. It's something that uh, is kind of missing from my personality. And uh, I'm sure for some people, it's an inherent way of understanding things. I mean, when I worked in radio, I built this kind of chronological sense. I, I had to keep track of the clock because there were only certain times that you could have to put the news on the radio and to play the different songs and you had to add up how long things were. And, and I built this 
kind of time sense in that I knew when I was speaking for 30 seconds or 60 seconds or, or so on. I, I built an inherent sense of time that I have seen uh, display itself in other situations when I focus and I know I have five minutes to make something take exactly five minutes or 15 minutes. But I don't have that with money. I don't have that ability to look at $50 and say, oh, this is good for this and this. And as I spend the money, realize I've spent this amount of money. I've gotten better than I was, but I'll always be struggling to learn that skill, a skill I, I probably should have learned a long time ago. I'm not going to say it's too late for me, but I am going to say that if you're somebody who influences the lives of young people, um, it's sometimes the case that people don't want to discuss money. It's, it's kind of funny. Some parents would rather discuss sex with their kids than money. And I think, personally, that an economic education is one of those things that literally pays off for the rest of your life. Let me be an example of that. And uh, thanks for helping me get my life back on track and for encouraging me to learn the skill at whatever age I've been able to.